Okay, we're back. We're live, 12 o'clock rock, with this new show, Creative Contributions. My guest is Julian Gorbach uh, from the School of uh, Journalism at UH Manoa. We're going to talk about his book that he's writing or has written uh, about a guy named Ben Hecht. It's really interesting. Um, it's going to be a bi biography of Ben Hecht, who was a Jewish fellow who wrote plays and got to be uh, a militant si a Zionist. He's often spoken of today as the Shakespeare of Hollywood, the film's industry, the film industry's most legendary screenwriter in those days, back in the, the 30s, I guess. He's perhaps more important as the man who broke the silence in America about the Nazi slaughter of European Jews. Beginning in the late 1930s, he became a lone voice in the wilderness, rebelling against his Jewish movie studio bosses when they refused to make films about the Nazi persecution. While the American press remained oblivious to the reports that surfaced early in World War II of a German extermination plan, Heck launched a massive one-man publicity campaign that mobilized public pressure on the Roosevelt administration for an allied rescue program. Then, after the war, this former Chicago crime reporter and gangster movie writer, Ben Heck, became notorious, shocking and outraging people across the world by partnering with a real gangster, <laughs> Mickey Cohen, you know that name, uh, to arm the Jews in Palestine and calling for a terrorism in the fight for a Jewish state in those days. Many now look back upon Hecht as a hero for his efforts at rescue, but his support for Jewish militants made him infamous in his time. The Tough Jew, a biography of Ben Hecht, is the story of how Hecht earned admiration as a humanitarian and vilification as an extremist at this pivotal moment in history. It's about the origin of his beliefs in his varied experiences in the American media and about the consequences of all that. Our guest, uh, like Ben Hecht, our guest Julian Gorbach, spent most of his years as a daily newspaper reporter on the police beat. That's well, going to be interesting to talk to him. He covered drive-by shootings and murder trials. He published an investigative series on killings that remain unsolved because gangs had intimidated witnesses into silence. There's courage there. As a freelancer, he contributed to the Boston Phoenix, the Time Out New York, the San Francisco Bay Guardian, and the New Orleans Gambit, among other publications. He covered Hurricane Katrina for the Boston Globe. He earned a doctorate in media history from the University of Missouri School of Journalism. And he's now an assistant professor at the School of Communications, the journalism program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We are honored to have you, have you here, Julian. Thank Thanks you. for coming down. Fabulous. My wow. pleasure. Yeah. So why did you write a biography about uh, Ben Hecht? I didn't know really very much about him at the beginning. I mean, I knew him mostly because I knew he had written this comedy called The Front Page, which some people say is the best comedy ever written for the American stage. Uh, like Tennessee Williams um, said that it had uncorseted American theater. <laughs> and, what, uh, what, what, what time frame are we talking about? That here? came out in 1927, but it's been made and remade over and over and over again. Uh, your guests. The mo probably the most likely uh, thing that your guests or version of it your guests would have seen would have been His Girl Friday with Cary Grant, which is uh, you know a hilarious version of it um, directed by Howard Hawks that was made in uh, like '41, I think. But it's been made. It was made into a movie by Billy Wilder in the early '70s um, with Jack Lemmon, and and it's uh, it, it, you know, to, to put it simply, it created the image of the fast-talking, cynical reporter with the fedora yanked down over his yeah, head and yeah. the cigarette butt in his mouth and the flask of whiskey. Yeah, and we know that image. Yeah. yeah um, Wish kind of, we had more of them today, don't you think? <laughs> so somewhat. They were a cynical breed, and they, they were not your New York Times reporter. This was the, uh, the Chicago journalist who was uh -huh. tough and, uh, and wanted the scoop. As far as uplifting the uh, the public or enlightening the public, that that was uh, they were too cynical. Well, but you know, stopping at that point just for a moment, it seems to me that journalism, you know, is a critical part of democracy. It's a critical part of the history of our country, yeah. and we and we see that in relief now. You know, with uh, Donald Trump trying to bypass the media and go directly to the public, it's all very kind of threat. And then the failure of print press journalism economically, this is all very threatening to, in my view, to our, um, uh, to our uh, democracy. Yeah. But in those days, 
this Chicago brand as opposed to, the, say, the New York Times brand, which is at a, a higher level, arguably. Right. Um, it, it was important for us to get to the bottom of what was going on. Uh, it was a competition for the scoop. It was that hard-driving cynicism, uh, you know, that, that informed the public, don't you think? Well, it was, a, it was an argument about um, two visions of journalism. The New York Times was the respectable, liberal, enlightened vision that, that uh, was kind of faithful to Thomas Jefferson's vision that the press should inform and engage the public. And the Chicago journalists didn't give a, a whit about trying to inform and engage. I mean, they, they just didn't believe the public was smart enough to get it. Um, that, that, that the public really cared. I mean, you have to realize, like, when the front page came out, Al Capone was ruling Chicago. He was ruling the politicians, and he was... And it didn't matter what the newspapers published as far as uh, scoops about corruption or whatever. Uh, it didn't seem to change the politics. So there was an argument between the two. At the time, uh, a, a lot of editors had gotten together because they thought journalism was getting out of control, and so they tried to create a rule book. The uh, Association of Newspaper Editors tried to say, look, we need to be objective, and maybe we should license journalists. Maybe li journalists should be licensed the way doctors or lawyers are. Licensing they, means the government has to make a judgment. Right. Ooh, that's... that's so tricky. they stopped back from that. <laughs> yeah. But they, they did, that, that's when they did draft the Code of Ethics. Mm -hmm. um, it's when journalism schools were developed and everything. And the Chicago brand was kind of this old school that had developed in the early... 20th century of, of fighting. There were, there were something like 12 different newspapers in Chicago, and they were all fighting for circulation. They literally got violent. And that's a whole story I tell in the book of the way that the thugs who ended up, the Capone thugs, used to beat up newspaper dealers on the street. So the, they got their training as thugs, and they were first on the payroll of newspapers in a bloody newspaper war oh, boy. before... Uh, before they became uh, Capone's gunmen with the passage of the Volstead Act, the, the prohibition in 1919. And at, by that time, the newspaper reporters of that era graduated too. Like heck, they had started c coming from Chicago to New York, writing plays about gangsters for, for Broadway, and then starting with heck, writing movies about gangsters for Hollywood when movies went to talk, and, uh, which was right around 1927. So he started in Chicago, sort of like you, I guess, he well, started not, in Chicago, not in Chicago. As, a, as, a, as, a, as a crime reporter. Yeah. Sort of like you, I guess. Yeah, I, well, I started as a crime reporter. I, I didn't start in Chicago. I'm from Boston. but uh, uh, I could tell. I could yeah. Tell. <laughs> <laughs> but he, um, you know, it was, it was, it's important today because my, my book is about a cynicism that hacked out about the public and about the nature of mankind. It's a cynicism about human beings that he learned both from being a newspaper reporter in Chicago and from being a crime reporter and seeing the darkest side of human beings on death row, you know, from interviewing killers and psychopaths and, and, uh, and from interviewing corrupt, stoogy politicians. Um, and uh, it's a story of where cynicism will take you um, into international politics through the rise of Nazism, into the establishment of the State of Israel. And, you know, it's a, it's a two-sided story because on the one hand, Hecht had a very deep understanding of our problems in American society and in, in, in our world civilization. Uh, he was right about a lot of it. But if you entirely surrender yourself to cynicism, where does that ultimately take you? What do you become? Oh, yeah. Well, but, but you know, query whether going from Chicago crime reporting to writing plays for Broadway is uh, an expression of cynicism. And query also whether writing plays in Broadway, thinking going from writing plays in Broadway to being a Zionist in Israel at the time of, you know, perhaps the most idealistic uh, metamorphosis of, you know, of what was going on in, in the Holy Land into the state of Israel. Yeah. That, was very, that was very idealistic, don't you think, especially after the war. So is that cynicism, or is that just metamorphosis? Well, you know, Hecht was, was an idealist when it came to art and storytelling and individual people. When it came to politics and people as masses, he was intensely cynical. And, and actually, in order to be a, a classic liberal in the sense that, that you and I might be, you have to have a certain amount of idealism about people collectively and about our politics, because you have to believe in things like the government of the people and... Uh, the, the, the notion that it's possible for the press or the media, like the... the, the he, he didn't believe that? No. <laughs> he, he didn't. <laughs> what is a cynic, Julian? 
Well, um, in his case, it was, um, he, th he, he went beyond thinking that people were a little bit dim, okay? So it wasn't so much that he said that, oh, people would read the newspaper and they wouldn't quite get it about corruption. It, it wasn't that he thought people were dumb, although he thought, he did think people were pretty dumb. Um, it <laughs> That's was, cynical. <laughs> yes. It, it was more that he thought that when you look globally at people as, like if you look at them as ants on an anthill, it, it, collectively, that they're driven to a large extent by really scary primordial passions, that those are always latent in us. I mean, I, I guess a lot of people understand it as the Hobbesian view. It's the view that that people have certain ugly prejudices, certain impulses towards violence, and you just have to poke it with a stick and it'll come out. I don't think like what, what's happened with Donald Trump um, over the last uh, year or so would surprise him at all. In yeah. fact, um, the thing that made Hecht such a strong voice when the Nazis were rising to power was that before anyone else saw it, he saw where this was going. He wrote an incredibly horrifying, vivid, short story describing the extermination of the Jews in 1938, when this was beyond the imagination. And, and, and the Germans hadn't even started their extermination no, program. No, it, it wasn't even a plan yet. It wasn't even a Nazi policy yet. The policy yeah. then was to make Germany Judenrein, which meant rid of Jews. Yeah. Uh, in fact, at the time, there was kind of an upside-down world where the Germans were trying to push uh, Jews out of Europe, and the British and the Americans and everything were trying to keep them in Europe. <laughs> so this is a bit upside down. Yeah. You know? Oh, those were strange and ugly days. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, but, but somewhere along the line, there was a metamorphosis with him, don't you think? I mean, because instead of you know, doing crime or doing you know, what he was doing about gangsterism, um, now he's talking about, uh, if not saving the world, then saving global Jewry, isn't he? He's talking about stopping the Nazis from what, you know, he perceived they would be doing. Well, I think with the rise of Nazism, he, he did have a couple of transformations. But you have to ask yourself whether those were complete reversals or whether those were part of an evolution. Because, of course, as a journalist and, and even as an artist, uh, politics was beneath him. To be actively engaged, to be an activist, was uh, something he didn't ever want to sully his hands with. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, he wasn't much of a Jew. I mean, he, he was a, uh, I guess you call it second generation Jew. His parents had come here from uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and he, he said it in one of his uh, many writings and memoirs that he spoke Yiddish until the age of eight or nine. But he <laughs> essentially, <laughs> yeah, I mean, essentially he, he grew up in Wisconsin, in, in rural Wisconsin, in the Midwest, in this sort of That's Tom different Sawyer like than thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he had, the, the family had moved when he was very young from the Lower East Side and from the, the old Jewish ghetto to rural Wisconsin. He'd had this very idyllic American upbringing, um, very Midwestern, and he'd forgotten about being Jewish. He didn't think it was important. And so two, two transformations, really, with the rise of Nazism. One yeah. was he suddenly started to realize he was a Jew and that it mattered being a Jew in America. Um, and second of all, he, he decided that he didn't want to be a do-nothing, see-nothing newspaper net, as he put it in one of his plays, that he, he felt that it gets to a point where people of conscience have to act. Ah, I love that. That goes for everyone, all of us, every single one. We have to see our conscience in act. Let's take a short break and ruminate on that. We'll come back in one minute. Julian Gorbach from the School of Journalism at UH Manoa. Aloha, my name is Justine Espiritu and I co-host Hawaii Farmers Series with Matthew Johnson of Oahu Fresh. We talk about Hawaii's local farmers and their supporters. In order to have a vibrant and sustainable local food system, uh, farmers are always the foundation, but there's so many other people uh, involved in the community that help support those farmers. So we bring those folks onto our show every Thursday at 4 p.m. We get their backstory, their history, find out a little more about them, and we find out why they love what they do and their perspective and their advice on how we can continue to have 
a dynamic and vibrant and sustainable local food system. So we, again, we broadcast live every Thursday at 4 p.m. And you can also catch us on ThinkTech's YouTube channel as well as Alelo54. So we hope you tune in and join us. Thank you. Okay, we're back. We're live with Julian Gorbach of the School of Journal Program and uh, Journalism at the School of Communications at UH Benoit. He's assistant professor there, and he's been writing a book about Ben Hecht, and you really need to know about Ben Hecht for many reasons. But uh, what you said a little while ago before the break was that uh, he didn't want to sully himself, Ben Hecht didn't want to sully himself with having opinions or showing through opinions. That, that, that's um, a matter of uh, journalistic ethics or the ethics of the time, isn't it? Well, he didn't want to sully himself with being actively engaged in politics up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. That's beyond just showing opinions. That's actually interfering with, with the course of events. Oh, actually be involved in history. Yeah. Going the journalists from, would watch history, report on history, but not be involved in yeah. history. Yeah, even the opinion writing journalists a lot of times stop short of actually getting in the middle of the riot or March whatever the parade, it is. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. He, he, he crossed that line. As far as the... the the line you're talking about between opinion and uh, what we call objectivity in journalism, he just never believed in the notion of objectivity, which is a flawed notion if you think about it. I mean, it, it, it's the idea that, that when you report on things, you can somehow be above a point of view, a personal point of view, and that you're not, you know, that the, you somehow rise above that. It's, it's not a very philosophically sound position you know anyway. what, I agree with you. Uh, everybody who reports, everybody who's you want to put in the ambit of journalism has a message, has a view, and it comes out if you watch. It always comes out. It's always there. You spoke before about uh, you know, the Hobbesian view of the world, mm -hmm. the cynicism and all that, as opposed to well, John Locke versus Hobbes, wasn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> My view of the world, by the way, is the mammalian view of the world. Uh, right. Is that everybody is a mammal, right. and everyone is driven by what drives mammals, and a lot of that is biochemistry over which we have no control at all. Yeah. And it makes us do things regardless of our, you know, sense of, um, our sense of civilization. Yeah. Sometimes that simply doesn't prevail, and we have plenty of proof about that. H Hecht might argue that there's a little bit of the reptile mixed in. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> the reptilian theory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, one thing that might be unclear to viewers that they're hearing me jump between his career in journalism and then his, his career in, as a writer and in Hollywood and then somehow how he gets mixed up in Zionism is how all this is connected. And I think what's been lost a little bit to, to contemporary readers and one of the things that I hope really comes through in the book is there's a fundamental argument still going on about the ideals of the Enlightenment. To, to a lot of people in Hex generation, the rise of Nazism was, was proof that a lot of the ideals of Thomas Jefferson, or whether you want to talk about the French philosophers, was, was flawed. Because in order to believe in things like the government of the people, or really any of the age of reason stuff, you have to first of all have a fundamental optimism about human nature. And you secondly have to believe that reason will actually make people more tolerant and, and, and make people better at arguing things. Whereas, you know, if you read uh, the Romantic view, which is sort of the opposite of the Enlightenment view, it's, well, reason will get you a machine to build a Frankenstein. <laughs> you know, reason will get you the technology to build a machine gun or an atom bomb. Um, it won't necessarily make you an enlightened human being. And as far as the enlightenment of human beings, we've talked about that. So, th so this fundamental disagreement about human nature and the role of reason uh, flows through whether you're talking about his view of journalism or his view of what the Jews needed to do to build a Jewish state. Like the, the more liberal Jews, you know, once the Holocaust had happened, the more liberal Jews wanted to appeal to the United Nations and take this kind of nonviolent political approach to, you know, please, let us have a state, you know, vote on it as an international community. And the, 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 the militant Zionists that Hecht was a part of said, screw that. We're going to bomb and shoot the British out of, out of Palestine. And then if the Arabs come after us, we'll, we'll you know, fight them off too. There were a number of people who held that view in that time. I, I'm, I, don't, I doubt it was the majority or prevailing group, but uh, it was, these were, those were tough times. It wasn't entirely clear. It wasn't at all clear that there would be a state of Israel. Yeah, there were two, 
you know, in Israel's DNA, there were two major groups vying for power. One was under the leadership of Menachem Begin, which was the Ergun, which was an armed uh, force. And the other was uh, David Ben-Gurion, who ended up being Israel's first prime minister. And, you know, he, he, they, of course, had the Haganah, which eventually became the Israeli Defense Forces. And, uh, and so there, that, that, that contest between those two groups eventually came to bloodshed in an incident in 1948 called between the Between two Al-Kalina. groups of Jews. Between two groups of Jews. In the middle of the Arab-Israeli War, there was an exchange of fire in, a, in an incident <coughs> with a ship that, that Hex Money had, an arm ship that Hex Money had funded, um, which was an Irgun ship that was about to land on the coast of Israel. And the, the, uh, David Ben-Gurion ordered the, is, the brand new Israeli Defense Forces to fire on the ship. And it killed 20 of Heck's friends and associates. And from that moment on, and this is in the middle of the Arab-Israeli war, from that moment on, Heck turned his back on Israel. And really? Because, yeah. the, because they fired on the ship? Because they killed some of the people who oh, were his friends. That's enough to turn you off. But, you know, I mean, I'm just taking us back to that point in time. This is 1948. This was right after the war. And, and memories of what happened in, in Warsaw and the ghetto and the, and the extermination camps are, are fresh. And uh, I mean, I think there were a lot of young Jews who had survived that time with, through wit and through violence. That otherwise, they would not have survived. And I think there must have been a substantial contingent of people who, remember, they used to say this: never again. Yeah. We're not going to be, you know, killed. We're not going to be marginalized, abused, um, uh, harassed, and killed ever again. Uh, and so that that was that was the credo of the time. Right. And I'm I'm guessing that's what he saw in it. He he was among those who were saying we're not going to let this happen again. Well, so there were there were two. There's two never agains. There's the David Ben Gurion never again, which is let's establish a United Nations. Let's create a United Nations Convention on Genocide. Let's introduce this term into the English language called human rights, and let's let's introduce an idea called. Um, international law and let's establish a united nations so that if a country goes out to to uh conduct a genocide like in aleppo or or you know or in the balkans or anywhere mm-hmm, else mm-hmm. that there's a international force that will collectively reimpose civilization basic human rights and and their idea of never the, uh, never again is hey the great democracies beat the nazis you know, the human rights and, and civilization won in that battle. Well, the never again to the Irgun and, and to Ben Hecht was, no, the Nazis killed six million Jews. The Nazis essentially wiped out European Jewry. The, the, the international community and the great democracies failed the Jews. And so never again means never again are we going to trust human conscience to, to stop a genocide or just to stop that's anything. more the cynical view isn't it yeah it's it's who what rules is it the rule of law or the rule of the gun survival yeah that's where he had to be but you know what i get out of this and, and really until today i hadn't thought about it or known much about it but he started out as a reporter he started out on the street mm-hmm. he started out observing and reporting on human conduct and you know in the raw form yeah and he takes that now he's sort of sensitized he takes that to larger issues, issues that can write more than a story about crime on the street. Now he's going to write a play in Broadway, and he's going to try to get his message. There's always a message, right? Yeah. He's trying to get his message out to larger groups of people because he understands at that time that writing a play would do that, would get his message out. Perhaps, you know, in the, in the pre-television world, uh, even when radio was, you know, still in infancy, mm-hmm. that was the way you got your message out. So now he's like globally aware. Now he's looking at the Nazis in the 30s. He's got a sense of awareness. This man had a sense of awareness. And ultimately, that drew him into being active, um, you know, an active militant Zionist. Um, Isn't that part of what happened here with him? Well, I mean, two things about it. One is that actually, while he was a crime reporter, while he was a young man in 1919, he was sent by the Chicago Daily News to Germany. Really? Right in the aftermath of World War One, mm-hmm. and one of the things he witnessed was the the German government at the time machine gunning either hundreds or thousands of people to death at a place called Moabit Prison, and so 
what he, in his memoirs, what he describes is that he had kind of a jolly, cynical view of the, the uh, hijinks in Chicago, all the corruption and, and the crime and everything, when he was a reporter in Chicago. But when he went to Germany in 1919, he saw the same criminality on a government level. Institutionalized. You know, right, exactly. Institu in the way that Al Cap when Al Capone would take over basically Chicago municipal affairs, you would have a criminal, a gangster, an organized criminal government. And so when he saw both the Allies and the Nazis of the World War II era, he saw global criminal activity. And he, it, he was deeply, deeply cynical about the Roosevelt administration and the British, which he held responsible for the massacre of Jews. He was trying to press them to have an allied rescue program, and he saw their failure to have an allied program to, to try and do something... As anti-Semitism. As, as aiding and abetting the greatest crime in history. Yeah. And, and as far as his publicity campaign... At the moment when a small group of activists from Palestine came in 1941 and recruited him to their cause right at, the, at 1941, at this crucial moment, he was the highest paid writer in Hollywood. He had incredible power in the media. And he also had that cynicism that we're talking about, about he didn't turn to muckraking or to investigative journalism. He turned to these big, glitzy propaganda efforts, if you will, to use his, all the Hollywood celebrities that, that weren't in movies that were about the Nazis because the, the Jews of Hollywood were afraid to make those movies, but to do these massive... Uh, he was in a hurry to get his message out. Yeah. That, that clearly, he, he had decided that he needed to do that. Uh, we don't have much time left, yeah. and I'd like you to read the part of the book uh, that you chose to read to our audience today. Could you do that? Sure. And I, I, should, uh, I should say that this... This is about the legacy of, of, to a large extent, of the Israel that we see today, and, and, and there's a broader implication, I think, in terms of American politics and the whole world. But uh, I said, Heck's remarkable pol polemics helped shape the public debate about what lessons to draw from the war. On the one side were the humanists, the mainstream Zionists, who envisioned the Jewish state as a liberal democracy and put faith in diplomacy, multilateralism, and international law. On the other side were Hecht and the Ergun, who believed that Jews could rely on and could be judged by no one but themselves. The liberals saw the war as a victory of their ideology over fascism. With the birth of the United Nations, the vote for partition, the Nuremberg trials, the first declaration on human rights, and a convention on genocide, the 1940s were formative years for international law, and Jews could point to these achievements as assurances of their basic rights. But conversely, Hecht and the Ergun read the war as confirmation that the Jews could not survive by the rules the world made for them. While the mainstream Zionists trusted in the United States and Britain, Hecht's faction maintained that even the world's great democracies had failed the Jews in their hour of need. Thus, while both sides vowed never again, they disagreed about how to guarantee that vow. The liberal Zionists believed in the rule of international law, while Hecht and the Ergun believed in the rule of the gun. Very interesting, provocative. You've done a lot of work on this. This is a great book. How can I get the book? Well, uh, I'm just submitting the manuscript to uh, Indiana University Press. So they're not, we haven't signed a contract. They're not under obligation yet to, to publish it, but uh, we've come along this far. They, they want the, the manuscript, and I think it probably takes about a year uh, to go through all the edits and everything. We'll wait. We got to see this book. This is yeah. an important book and relevant in our time. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Julian Gorbach. Really appreciate you coming down. Thank you for inviting me. It was, it was awesome.